Greetings, friends. I'm Pastor Del Keeney of the Mechanicsburg Church of the Brethren, and on behalf of our congregation, I am pleased to welcome you to a time of worship and reflection. We have already been blessed by music that has guided us to think about the season that we are in and how it is that God is at work, how it is that love lives again. Whether you are joining us in person today in our hybrid worship, by Zoom, or through one of our online opportunities, we are grateful that you have come, and we pray that you will be strengthened and guided through this time together. As we enter these moments of worship, I invite you to hear reflections from the writer of First John. We will be sharing this text in two portions. But I invite you to hear these words as a testimony that reflect our own hearts in this time after Easter Sunday, when we are still rejoicing in the good news of Jesus' resurrection, but beginning to come to grips with what that resurrection means. Hear this testimony from the writer of 1 John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 
we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. The testimony of those who followed Jesus beyond his resurrection appearances into the world is a testimony that shares the conviction that though we may not have in person seen and touched him, we have known him and the reality of his good news, of all that comes through his death and his resurrection. Join me now in prayer. Holy God, we thank you in this day for the good news that continues to resound in this world and in our lives amidst all the chaos that we also face. It is the good news that love lives again, the good news that Jesus is raised from the dead and that he reigns. This day again, allow us to journey with the disciples as they come to grips with this good news and as they experience their call in the aftermath of Jesus' death and his resurrection. May we find in their journey a resonance with our own so that we may be faithful followers in our day as they were in theirs. Guide us now by your word and your spirit as we worship together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you now to join in singing our first hymn, number 264 in our Church of the Brethren hymnal, Come Ye Faithful, Raise the Strain. Let us sing together. We have already heard the opening words of 1 John, chapter 1. I continue now reading from chapter 1, verse 5, through chapter 2, verse 2. Before I begin, I would make you aware that the writer of 1 John, who echoes many of the themes and the patterns of the Gospel of John, is speaking to a community with a deep concern 
for there are some around them that are not so convinced that Jesus needed to come in the flesh to die for our sins. Some that are convinced that perhaps Jesus did not take on human form and did not become like one of us. In response, the writer of 1 John shares these words to his community to encourage and to help them in their faith. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord for us. Thanks be to God. Let us ponder them as we share in the musical interlude. Last Sunday on Easter Day, we shared the testimony of the Gospel of Mark and the conclusion of its resurrection story. The Gospel of John shares some of the same themes, but in a very different way, as Jesus appears first to Mary and then 
to the other disciples. As we enter the story today, it is the conclusion of the day, the evening after the morning, where Mary and the others have encountered the empty tomb. Where Peter and the beloved disciple have run to the tomb and come back, one believing, one puzzled, both in awe at what they have seen. Listen now as I read from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nail in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life. In his name. This too is the word of the Lord for us. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. In these moments, O oh God, take us again into the encounter of your disciples with their risen Lord. May we find ourselves among them and know in ourselves the struggle between disbelief and worship. The challenge that comes in seeing something that is too good to be true and realizing that rather than facing the end, They are facing a new beginning. Open us now to your word, the testimony of your followers, and to your spirit, 
that we may find breathed into ourselves both your good news and your call. Guide the one who speaks that he may speak your truth and those who listen that they may hear all that you have for them this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I know it may surprise you, but as a pastor, I find it more freeing to be able to think about Jesus' resurrection on the Sunday after Easter than it is on Easter Sunday. On Easter Sunday, we as believers are caught up in the good news, in the music, in the celebration of his resurrection, and we proclaim it as if we always believed it. You already know, many of you from my comments last Sunday, that the disciples were not there right away. That the women went running and were silent, according to Mark. And that even in the Gospel of John, the disciples did not know how to make sense of the words of Mary after Jesus appeared to her. And then the words of Peter and the beloved disciple when they came running back to talk about the empty tomb. No, it's a comfort to know that their journey from disbelief to belief, from puzzlement to wonder, took some time. As we're invited into the Gospel of John and our text for today, the time has gone from the morning until the evening. Still not very long, but a time in which the process, what has happened, the news that they are dealing with has caused the disciples to have incredible conversations. We're not privy to them, but you can imagine them. What if it were true? How can it be true? What is this news that we have heard? Is Mary a visionary or is she mad? What of these other disciples? What sense can we make of this day? For we know he died. We know he was buried. Can he be raised? Well, into the midst of their conversations, which, by the way, were happening behind closed doors. John tells us for fear of the Jews, because what happened to Jesus could easily happen to each one of them. In that place of fear and isolation, the risen Jesus comes. And he greets them. Peace be with you. And they see him, and they are overjoyed. But he has not come simply to give them the confidence that he has raised. He has come to give them a purpose, a purpose not unlike the calling that was given in the Gospel of Mark to go ahead and to meet him in Galilee. But here in John, what Jesus does is to extend his peace to his disciples and then to breathe upon them his spirit, to breathe into them his life. And with the spirit and with that life comes a calling, an opportunity, an invitation to be about his work which is the work of forgiveness. Jesus says to the disciples, if you forgive the sins of any, they will be forgiven. And as our translations read, 
If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Often, we in the church have struggled around the difference between those two and sometimes stumbled over this need to be judge and jury over others. But the work of Jesus that he gives to his disciples it is the work of extending his grace to the world. A grace that is fulfilled through his death on the cross and confirmed in his resurrection. We do know the story of Thomas. And he is often the one who gets attention in this part of the gospel. We think of him as a doubter, but truth be told, he is only asking to see what the others have already seen. He is only acknowledging what each one of them has experienced, and that is until they saw with their own eyes, until they had the opportunity to get close, that it was a struggle to imagine Jesus alive. Thomas confesses his heart. And by grace, Jesus returns the next week. Fascinating to find the disciples still behind those closed doors. Are they still fearful? Are they still trying to make sense of what they've been called to do and be? Perhaps. But Jesus comes among them. And Thomas is with them. And Jesus, in gracious and graceful ways, extends his hands and opens his side and invites Thomas to touch, to see, to believe. And Thomas proclaims the most remarkable testimony in the gospel, my Lord and my God. As the writer of the gospel concludes Jesus' words, he testifies to the hope that will be reflected in 1 John, that there will be some who will be believing even though they do not have the opportunity to see, that they will be blessed and they will find life in him. By the time we hear the words of 1 John, we find those within the Christian community struggling at times to understand what his resurrection means. Some, it appears, have come to believe that Jesus was never really fully human. And in fact, like they imagine him to be, they are spirit that is sinless. True. The Gospel of John and the writer of 1 John confess that Jesus was sinless and that he was the atoning sacrifice. But they also confess that he is the one that has made himself known that they have seen, that they have heard. Did they do that literally? Or did they simply encounter him in a way that convinced them that he lived among them, that he died for them, and that he was raised for their sakes and for the sakes and the sins of the world? In the words that Jesus speaks to his disciples in John chapter 20, he doesn't speak of their sin but he demonstrates his grace in that they are all forgiven and given the opportunity to extend forgiveness to the world. The writer of 1 John reverberates that message 
reminding his listeners that they are not without sin, but that they are recipients of that same grace. That as they confess their sins, they have an advocate, Jesus, the righteous, through whom God has forgiven them and the whole world, all who will confess their sin. At the same time, he reminds them, speaking perhaps to adversaries outside of their circle, that those who claim to be without sin are in darkness and are in judgment, that they are liars and they make God to be a liar because the very reason for Jesus coming into our world, coming into our lives, is to lead us from our sin into his life. This day, we understand the struggle that comes in believing that Jesus is raised from the dead. For a disciple like Thomas, He had no frame of reference. He had no basis to believe. He needed to see. For us, we have the testimony of those who have gone before us. Not only that, but we have the reality of God's presence with us through the risen Christ and his spirit. But we too need to remember that his coming was into the world. That God sent his son into the world. That God gave his only son for the world. And that in giving that gift, a gift that was raised up when Jesus was raised on the cross, a gift that was extended as his blood flowed from that place to cover our sins. That in that gift, God was not only extending grace to his disciples, forgiveness to those who had betrayed him, but God was extending grace to the whole world. And as he raised his son from death to life, God was proclaiming that that forgiveness would be there forever for all who would turn to him, for all who would confess their need and confess their sin. Friends, we, as followers of Jesus, as those who walk behind the steps of those first disciples, know our own sin. May we remember it, and at the same time, may we remember that the very one who forgives them forgives us. The very one who breathes into them breathes into us. The very one who calls them to extend grace and forgiveness is the one who calls us to do the same. May we continue his work and take up his mantle as we walk in his steps, following the risen Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we continue to be amazed with your first followers trying to understand fully all that has happened. We remember your death. It was real. Your suffering, it was complete. Your agony, it was for us. But this day, and in days to come, may we mingle that suffering with the good news 
that it did not end your reign, but began it as you were raised from death to life and came among your disciples to give them the good news, to extend to them your calling. May we continue in that calling this day, thousands of years later, May we demonstrate and extend your grace, a grace that is greater than our sin. We pray it in your holy name. Amen. Friends in Christ, as we respond to the word today, I invite you to join in singing this hymn of affirmation and testimony. I know that my Redeemer lives. It is number 186 in our Red Church of the Brethren hymnal. Let us join together and sing our faith. Friends in Christ, as you go from this time of worship and reflection, remembering the encounter that Jesus had with his first disciples, may you share in their wonder, but also share in their call. For what was given to them is given to us as well. Jesus breathes into us his spirit and calls us to forgive as he has forgiven. No, we are not the ones who accomplished that great accomplishment, the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. But yes, we are among those who are given the task to extend that grace and forgiveness that began with our risen Lord and Savior. May we take that task to heart and continue the work of Jesus in the world. May you go in the peace of Christ that he has extended to you. Amen.